choir sings, Jesus is Lord of all. so much choir take your hymnals once again turn to page 693 page 693 a shelter in the time of storm please stand with us again page 693 Let's play through that a time or two. Time or two. Get around, shake hands with your neighbor. Sing that second. A shade night.
sing that last. O rock divine, O refuge dear, shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper, ever near, shelter in the time of storm. Thank you. Please be seated. And now we have Pastor Smith, Carla, and Julie to sing for you. I'll behold a million scenes of rare beauty will demand that I view them still Jesus will outshine them all mansions will glisten on the hills of gold streets of gold. Thousands of people will demand that I view them. Still Jesus will shout shine them all. The sparkling river is flowing. Happy faces all glowing. Land of splendor The golden streets give reflection of that city's perfection, but Jesus will outshine them all. Mansions will glisten on the hills of glory. streets of gold angel choir singing that praises forever still Jesus will outshine them all angel choir singing that praises forever still Jesus Thank you very much. Good to see each of you here today. And I'd like to give you some announcements. Number one, I want to recognize a couple of people. I'm looking around to see if I got any other first time visitors, and I don't think I do. I saw uh, Donnie Ruiz up there practicing his hula dance. 
Back from Hawaii. You're shaking your head. No, no, you did the fire dance. Is that right? One of those muscle guys out there throwing the fire around. Yeah. Yeah, Carla danced with that guy when we were out there. I haven't gotten over that yet. Um, Julie's laughing because it was her fault, and I don't know if I ever told her that I've been mad at her ever since, but should have put her up there. Um, anyway, we're getting away from the subject here. Uh, to the Ruiz family, Ruiz family, good to have you back. And uh, the people that I was going to mention, and will mention, Danny and Heidi Henry, right over here. And we know them. Now, Pastor Smith uh, built that church down there, Bethel Baptist, that, and he's worked down there and all of that. Heidi, of course, we've been associated with for years and years. And her dad is Gary Schroeder, and we've known him forever. So uh, anyway, I uh, had a great time uh, talking to, well, both of them a little bit, and, and uh, Daniel quite a bit. Yesterday afternoon, at a, we were together at a function. And uh, he's a real great guy. He's a little, emphasizes too much, a little bit on the athletics and sports stories. So, you know, I don't like that too good, but I can get past it. So anyway, uh, I'm really glad that they're here today. And I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Seldom as it may be. They could be in the market for another church. So, yeah, thank you, Carla. <laughs> so uh, if you don't talk to them or say hi to them or tell them how happy you, uh, you are that they're here, then uh, don't blame me if the church doesn't grow. And these are good people, good people. So God bless you. Thanks for coming. Great to have you with us. Anybody else? First time here. Let me put my glasses on. I didn't see anybody. All the old buddies are here. Great to see each of you. And uh, Betty Jane Martin isn't feeling too well today, kind of not getting around real good. So uh, the young couple took off without her, and we miss her and praying for her. We'll see her, Lord willing, next week. February 8th, and that shocks me even to see February on our announcements because, say what, we've already gone through January and you know, it's crazy how fast life goes, amen? Now, maybe not for kids, but for people that are in the upper age limits of this life, it seems like it just flies by. February 8th, track distribution at 7 o'clock in the morning. February 15th, Valentine dinner at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Cost to be announced. We've got to figure out what we're going to do for food. But cost will be as low as we can get it, okay? So we're going to have a Valentine's banquet. And uh, you can come without a date. You ladies that are not married and are happily single, just we want you to come. Is that right, Carla? Or is that? Yeah, we want them to come. We want everybody to come. And you guys are complaining about we never do anything. Don't stay home. Okay? As well, we never do anything here. We're going to have a banquet. We're going to have a good time. We're going to put the details together. It's going to be good food. We're going to have a real good time. So be there, and we'll keep the cost low. And if you have any problem with a ticket or anything, you see either Pastor Lyle Smith or my wife, and they'll buy you a ticket. Won't they, Arlene? They will, won't they? Yeah, we'll tell them not to, but they're going to do it anyway, because they spend money like a bunch of drunken sailors. And like Reagan said, that would be unfair to drunken sailors, because at least they're spending their own money. All righty. We're moving on. There will be a... Uh, a uh, day of grieving and memorial service for the Denver Broncos and uh, Peyton Manning uh, Monday night. Speaking of Monday night, on a serious note, this is really going to happen. And I've got it all written down right here in detail somewhere. The ladies' Bible study is going to crank up again on Monday night. What time? 6.30. Going to be tea and everything and get together. And going to go through the Bible. And we'll be talking about Jeremiah. We're in Jeremiah. So ladies, get back in it. Amen? You may live without Jesus and go your way. You may bear your own burdens and never pause to pray. You may choose your own goals and strive to attain. All this without Jesus is striving in vain. You may live without Jesus and live without peace. You may work without Jesus, your wealth to increase. But you'll find out too late. Such pain does not last. Your hands will be empty when life is all past, 
You'll be facing the grave with its unknown dread, asking, where will I be? Yes, where, when I'm dead? Should you die without Jesus and go to your grave, since without his forgiveness forever sin slave? Yes, if still without Jesus, when hearing death's call, unsaved soul, you have nothing, no nothing at all. How true, amen? And with that thought, here's a nice little track, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Talks about we're all lost in sin, God is perfectly holy, and Jesus bridged the gap in the cross of Christ. And then there's a great plan of salvation right here on the back, so grab some of those, hand them out, and uh, let's see what God will do with the word when we put it out into the world. Amen? Gentlemen, if you come, we will take a Sunday morning offering. Father, thank you that we can come together, God, another day that you've given us by thy grace that we may serve you. And God, we're blessed, blessed of all people, on our way to heaven. God, thank you for it. And oh God, if there's anyone here today that has not made that decision in their own heart, we pray today would be the day. So thank you. We want to praise your holy name. Give you all of the reverence, God, that you deserve. And God, thank you for loving the likes of us. Now bless our offering. Thank you for each person here today. What a blessing to see people come out to the house of God to learn more about him and to worship him and to serve him. Thank you for that. Now bless, we pray, and forgive me of my sins, I ask. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. stuff. Well, I saw some of the ushers looking up at the ceiling, and I remembered we had a work day yesterday. Uh, ben Mitchell was here, and uh, Gerald R. Mitchell, Jr., the third and the fourth, and Enoch, and uh, Larry, who's out racing today because he figured he fulfilled his holy day of obligation by coming to the work day. Uh, but uh, we, we worked on all of these lights, and uh, the ones that aren't lighting now, it's because the ballast is no good. And I have ballast in my office, but we got to set up staging or do something that we can get up there. As I mentioned in Sunday school, we can get to the lights with ladders. Now, yesterday we had to move several pews. So you got to unbolt the pews and pick them up and move them or shove them out of the way and all of that stuff. It's quite a, it's quite a job, and uh, thank God for the people that came. You Doing that is uh, just it's a tough job. But uh, we're working on the lights. we got three of them that did work. So uh, we replaced all the bulbs of the ones that were out. Three of them worked. The others, we got to get them down. And uh, Troy can work on ballast and maybe Buzzy, too. And I don't know if we can do all of it in a day, but we'd need all the help we could get. We'd have to move pews out of the way and set up staging in several different locations. So we're working on it. Amen? So we're trying to get enough light here so you guys won't fall asleep while I'm preaching is, is the object objective. So uh, thank you guys that came out for work day and... Uh, we're on it, okay? You can, um, if you can't come out to work day, just send us a check for $1,000 and it'll speed up the process. And other than that, we're still on it. Brother Mike.
Take your hymnals one last time, please. Page 638, stand with us. 638, I need thee every hour. Sing that last. I need the every Again, we have Pastor Smith, Carla, and Julie to sing for you. Thank you. 
If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Galatians chapter 1, please? Galatians chapter 1. Verse 6. There in Galatians 1, 6, we read the following. Paul writes to the church at Galatia, or to the Galatians, and says this, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and pervert, would pervert the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray as we look to thy word this morning that you would speak to our hearts and challenge us God, thank you for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Bless each of us, and again, thank you for each person that's come today. Might we exalt you. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. To be removed from the gospel is to be removed from Christ. It says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him. And I wonder if when we, you know, get away from the Bible a little bit, if we realize we're getting away from Christ. You know, no matter how we excuse it or explain it. But in this particular instance, the new gospel, whatever it was, was not the gospel. It was a perversion. We don't want a new gospel. We want the old-time gospel. And there is no other gospel but the old-time gospel. Last Sunday and also Wednesday, we made reference to Philip the Evangelist, complimenting him on his service to the Lord Jesus Christ as a faithful, consistent Christian. And one of the great episodes in his life was that story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And that's in Acts chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, again, would you flip back to Acts chapter 8. And what we especially noted, we're not going to read the whole story again. It's a great story of how that uh, God called him out into the desert. And we talked about that, whether God called him to the multitudes and Went him by the bucketful and had revival in Samaria, or whether he called him out into the desert. Philip went. He obeyed. He didn't say, hey, wait a minute, i got a big ministry going here. None of that. And when he told him to go and join himself to the chariot, he ran. He got with it. But uh, what we want to talk about here is in verse uh, 35, 36, and 37, where... We have the dialogue and the conversation taking place. And I, the eunuch asked him about the scripture that he was reading, about whether he was talking about himself or some, some, someone else, some other man. In verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And again, this is repetition for me to say this, but Spurgeon told his preacher boys, uh, you know, take a scripture and make a beeline for the cross. And there is no place in the Bible that you can go that we ought not be able to take it and preach Christ. And that's what Philip did. He said, boy, he must have been a great soul winner. Well, I mean, God's given you the manual, amen? If we'll take it and use it, it'll work. Now, it won't work every time. I understand that. But we need to be willing just to take it and trust it and use it. And that's what Philip did. So Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that he the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. We especially noted this part of the dialogue between the evangelist and the eunuch. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on the way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Well, in the uh, New International Version, and if you've got it, I don't want to drive you away or anything. I just uh, hate it and want to criticize it. But I don't want to drive you away. But in the New International Version, it reads this way. Now listen carefully. Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Okay, all right. 
look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? Instead of what, look, here's water, see, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? All right. And then the very next words that we read in the New International Version are this. He gave orders to stop the chariot, then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. What's missing? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. That's eliminated. There's no inclusion of that. Now, keep that thought in mind and go back to Luke chapter 3, if you would. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. I'm talking about the old-time gospel. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to read down a few verses here. Beginning in verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Idiorea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias be, uh, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, this is prior to the church age, folks. This is not in the church age yet. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, hasn't even been really announced. He hasn't been crucified. We haven't entered into the church age. But he's preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he, John the Baptist, then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. Now, picture, there's a bunch of, there's a multitude, okay? Uh, I've never had a multitude come to me and say, I want to be baptized, depending on what you call multitude. Peter preached and 3,000 got saved. Those were some days when people flocked to the gospel. And John the Baptist made, I mean, quite a scene. He was a going thing. And here he is, and he's out there preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, and here comes the multitudes. Multitude came forth to be baptized of him. Here's what he said to them. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. Now, God help the preacher now that does that here in the Laodicean church age. Amen? When a bunch of people come up and say, Pastor, I want to be baptized. You say, look, you snakes. Pastor was talking about how much he hated snakes today. Hey, look, you bunch of snakes. Who's warned you to come? Let me see some works out of you. Bring forth fruits, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. Now, do we notice something in the old-time gospel presentation? Number one, Philip agreed to baptize with an if. If you believe with all your heart. Philip wasn't giving out trips to Vegas or lottery tickets to all comers. Come get baptized, we'll give you a cheeseburger and an ice cream sundae. Now, you want to do that? Go ahead. But that's not what, that's not what Philip was saying. He said, if he was demanding of the candidate, sure, I'll baptize you, but under certain conditions. Believe. We call it believer's baptism. Because we're not believing anybody, we're not baptizing anybody, unless they profess the new birth experience. They have believed and received the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we baptize. That's why we don't baptize infants. We don't christen infants. You say, would there be anything wrong with christening infants? I don't know, but it looks too much like uh, some kind of perverted baptism to me, so I wouldn't do it. Give people a wrong impression. You say, what do you do? Well, if a couple of parents uh, want to come up, or a parent could be that way, come up and say we want to dedicate our child to the Lord Jesus Christ publicly and let everybody know that we're going to bring that baby up in the nurture, the admonition, the instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to pray for his salvation at the appropriate time that he would follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. We do that. 
And that's a lot more scriptural than taking a baby and dunking him and thinking there, there now, he's part of the church and he's headed for heaven. Baptism is not one of the sacraments, my friends. It's something you do because you're saved, not to get saved. Well, it's believer's baptism. Believe in heaven. Now, I would say this to you. Proper belief in heaven believes in hell. Let's not try to air condition hell. Amen? Let's not, oh, well, we don't talk about that, preacher. Wait a minute. You believe in heaven. That necessitates, really, a belief in hell. Why? Because the same one that told you about heaven told you about hell. If there's no hell and no lake of fire, Jesus is a liar. And you're believing in Jesus, and he's the one that told you there's a hell that we need to flee from. And we never need to warn people that. We don't have to be happy they're going there. We're not. But to preach the old-time gospel, we better be preaching a hell that's hard. Amen? And then we need to believe in Christ. Proper belief in Christ includes believing in Satan. Oh, well, I don't want to get off on that Satan stuff. We, we talked about the fall today in Sunday school. Listen, I listened to it and Dr. Smith preached it. Well, look, Satan was there in the garden, tempting. He's still tempting. He's still walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's still deceiving people. He's still out there to either send you to hell or once you get saved to negate your salvation any way, every way possible and to ruin your life and make a mockery out of your life. He's still doing that. Don't come to me and say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in Satan. A proper believe in Christ, he died to save you from the wiles of the devil. And of course, a belief in salvation itself. A proper belief in salvation includes a belief that some can be lost. Look, if we weren't all lost, why did we have to get saved? We have to get saved because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because the wages of sin is death, and not just physical death, but eternal death in the lake of fire that the Bible calls the second death. So when we believe in heaven, we also believe in hell. When we believe in Christ properly, we believe in Satan. When we properly believe in getting saved, we understand that there's a whole bunch of people that are lost. Just to mention a few things that talk about, if thou believest, thou mayest. Now there's also a matter of degree. He said, if thou believest with all thine heart. There is no halfway with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor mentioned that today. He said the two groups of people, the saints and the ain'ts. Amen? You're a believer or you're not. In Mark 12, 28, if you'd like to turn there, we can. Mark chapter 12. Verse 28. Jesus had this conversation with a well-versed, intelligent, and sincere, apparently sincere scribe. In verse 28, And one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he, that would be Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So that's what Jesus said to him. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. Now the scribe's answering. He says, For there is one God, and there's none other but he, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And certainly it's true. If we love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves, look, we're not going to put any other gods before him. 
We're not going to build any graven images. We're not going to take the name of the Lord God in vain. We'll honor, we don't honor the Sabbath exactly, but every, every day is holy to the Lord in the New Testament. We're not going to cheat, lie, steal, murder, commit adultery, covet, and all of those things. We're not going to do those if we're right with God and if we love our fellow man. It was a great answer. And the scribe recognized that. And here's what Jesus said. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Say, man, that's good. But can I just say that not far means you're not there? You're not far, you're not there. I'll talk to my wife every now and then. She'll say, where are you? I'm almost home. Make sure I'm not breaking the law, of course. So I'm at Valley View and Imperial, yelling into my phone that's in my lap. I don't want to be not far from the kingdom, if I can use a double negative there. I want to be in the kingdom and at the kingdom. I want to be there. I don't want to be not far. I've told you before, look, I was under conviction about getting saved. And I hadn't been saved. And there were all kinds of issues running around. But I had come to the conclusion that what Buddy Franklin was preaching was true that the Bible was 100% true. I'd, I'd come to that conclusion. I had not acted upon it. Now, I'm driving down Broadway. That's in Bangor, not New York. Driving down Bangor, and I'm thinking, man, if this car went off the road, my 65 Merc, if it went off the road and I got killed, I came before the Lord, I could say, you know, Lord, you knew that I was going to accept you. Now, that won't get you into the kingdom, folks. You knew I was going to. Today's the day of your salvation. Well, I'll say this, though. When you start thinking like that, you know you're under conviction, don't you? When you start thinking those kind of thoughts, you're under conviction. wasn't long before I got saved, and then I got saved. Man, I'm driving down Broadway again, going back home, and I'm riding along and say, Hey, if this car goes off the road now and I get killed, boom, I'm going to heaven. Forget that not far stuff. I'm there. I'm in it. Now with Christ, if you're not all in, then you're out. You say, now, preacher, you're not talking about a salvation by works, are you? No, I'm not. I'm talking about an honest to God belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that he's taught in his holy word. That we really embrace that, that we believe in it. And if you don't have that, something's wrong. And Philip wasn't going to shortcut it, and John wasn't going to sugarcoat it. I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. I'm just saying that you need to believe in Christ and embrace him completely. Yes, we're all going to sin, but there ought to be a conviction about that sin, as in under conviction. Boy, if there's no conviction. Wow. Has your heart been seared to the point that you're saved, but you're just not convicted anymore because you've gotten so far away from Christ? We've you heard the quote, the same sun that softens the sand also hardens the clay. So either you're not saved or you're in one backslidden condition that's unbelievable. There ought to be a conviction. Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Talk about discipleship. There were five foolish virgins who wanted entrance to the marriage. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. When God closed the door of the ark, that was that. And don't forget those miracle workers over in Matthew. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me the work of iniquity. What I'm suggesting this morning is that we ought to preach and practice an old-time gospel. And that maybe, slash definitely, we ought to every now and then do a little self-check. 
Now, I'm not a guy that says the only way you can get saved is by coming to me at the Pioneer Baptist. I've never said anything like that. Don't believe that. Don't teach that. And I actually abhor that kind of thing. If somebody comes here and they say, I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe in him sincerely, and I believe that book, listen, that's good enough for me. You know? And if you got a speeding ticket last night, I'm not going to say it's because you weren't saved. Okay? We're not in here. We don't, we don't talk that way or believe that way. But it's still good to do a little self-check every now and then. Now, here we go. Matthew chapter 7, verse 18. Matthew chapter 7, verse 18. Here's your self-check. <clears throat> Profile yourself. Talk about the cops profiling people, right? I think that's an excellent idea, by the way. Amen? I'm not worried about a 95-year-old grandma from uh, Nebraska blowing up the plane. If I see five people from other nations getting on, dressed funny, talking in a different language, and getting on there and yelling things from row to row, I think it's time to throw them off the plane. Profile yourself. A good tree, Matthew 7.20 says, excuse me, 7.18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. You can't do it. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. He says, oh, I don't want anybody judging me. and Everybody wants to judge me. How about judging yourself? How about looking in the mirror and say, what kind of person am I? How am I known? And by the way, you establish your own reputation, don't you? Amen? We can talk about, you know, your reputation is how other people know you and your character is how God knows you. But look, you show your character and you develop your own reputation. Over a period of time. Look in the mirror and say, hey, what kind of person am I? Am I bringing forth good fruit? Then prove yourself. 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Look, I really don't care what anybody else thinks about you, to be honest with you. I think it's nice if they think highly of you. But what do you think of yourself? When you're honest with yourself, what do you think? My brother was talking to my dad about drinking, and my dad was in his uh, later years. And my brother told me this, Pete Mitchell. He said, I was talking to dad about this, and he drank too much. And uh, according to my brother, never knew him to be a liar. He said, my dad said to him, do you think I like being like this? Look in the mirror. Do you like what you see? I don't care how anybody else is judging you. What do you see yourself? Profile yourself and then prove yourselves. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says this. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? Go back to it. And somebody says, well, man, I don't know. Did I really get saved? I say, look. And Dr. Smith talked about this in Sunday school, too, I think a couple of weeks ago. He said, hey, maybe everybody's had these thoughts. Buddy Franklin talked about some of those thoughts and said that's Satan that puts them in there. But if Satan comes attacking you on the basis of your salvation, I say go right back to the word. Where's our authority? Right here. If I want to know how to spell a word, I look it up in the dictionary. Here's your authority. It told you how to get saved, didn't it? You can tell me the verses. You go over to Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Go back and ask yourself, hey, did I do this? Say, I don't know if I was sincere or whatever. Well, why did you do it? 
Did you do it to sell insurance to the people in the church? Did you do it because you wanted to impress your girlfriend? Or did God lead you to that point where you asked him to save you? If you've done that with the right attitude, my friends, I don't care how much theology you knew, you knew enough to know that Jesus Christ was God, that he was going to save you from hell if you'd receive him, and you made that decision, and then it's God's problem. And God doesn't have any problems. Amen? Now it's all God. We talk about that little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can. Let me tell you something. God is a big engine that could. Amen? And when you hook up to God, you're going over the mountain. Don't worry about the rest of it. Don't worry about if he can keep you saved. He's well able to keep you saved. Don't worry about if he will. He will. Prove yourself. Profile yourself. Prove yourselves. And then push yourselves. The eunuch said this. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I know we all want to be rewarded for our service. We should be. God set it up. God set it time and time again. Talks about our rewards. We'd be fools not to want to be rewarded. I know we all want to be recognized for our service. I mean, that's just who we are. But why do we have to be begged to give service? Why do we have to be begged to serve God? Why aren't we rather demanding to serve God? Why do we say, I've been hurt, now I'm not going to serve? Ah, oh, God let me down. God will never let you down. You may go through some trials and tribulations, but I'll tell you, God will never let you down. And so why did this happen, preacher? I'm not God. I don't have a clue. Peter Ruckman says, God knows what he's doing and nobody else does. Keep that in mind every now and then. You'll find out when you get to heaven why all this stuff takes place. But we're going through trials and tribulations in this life. Less in America than they do on the mission field, I believe. And some have it tougher than others. There's no doubt about that. Today, somebody's in the hospital that got paralyzed last night. Maybe they're a Christian. Somebody's house burned down. Somebody lost a loved one. Lucille Payne, her sister, died. Keep her in prayer. There are tough times in this life. There's no doubt about that. But look, don't go on this, oh, God hurt me, I'm not going to serve him anymore. You are not thinking right. Why do you do that? Instead of taking the attitude of this, hey, you can't stop me from serving God. Well, this preacher let me down. Oh, this preacher ran away with the organ player. He let me down. Well, boy, I'll never do anything like that. I'll never believe in God again. I'll never go to church again. What are you talking about? Who's your belief in? Your belief is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to say, there ain't no preacher on earth that can stop me from serving God. That's what we ought to say. You say, you teaching me not to honor the preacher? No, honor me for sure. But no, listen, seriously, we're supposed to respect the man of God. I'm just saying, when they prove they're human and act like a dog or something or fall down in the mud like a pig and don't get out, don't give up on God. Don't do that. Say, hey, nobody can stop me from serving God. That person hasn't been born that can stop me from serving God. He said, here is water. And if I were to paraphrase, eunuch says, here's water. I want to be baptized. What's hindering me? Oh, there's an if? No problem. I'm on board with it all the way. I'm in. I believe. I'll show you the fruits. Let's go. Let's do it. That ought to be our attitude. Oh, well, preacher, can you talk me into being baptized? You ought to be coming to me and saying, I want to, if I haven't been baptized, I want to be baptized, preacher. Well, I said, well, hey, I got to check you out, man. Have you been saved? Yes, I have. When? Over here. How? What do you do? Yeah, okay. And I want to be baptized. And preacher, you better do it, because if you don't, somebody else will. Amen? We ought to demand it. Look, if I say stay home today and watch a football game, you ought to say, no way, preacher, I'm coming to God's house. Amen. We ought to be demanding to serve Christ. Let's get with it. Christ is going to know who I am. He's going to know me. Never will I knock at the door and him say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. That's not going to happen. He's going to know who I am. 
I may not be the best, but I'm going to be there. I may not win all the fights, but I'm going to show up. Amen? Why? Because I'm not going to be not far. I'm going to be in the body of Christ. The Bible says this in John 6, 37. Jesus said, all that the Father give me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I'll no wise cast out. We ought to say, look, the Father drew me. The Father gave me. He drew me, and he gave me to Jesus Christ. How did I get to the Bangor Baptist Church? Open the yellow pages and pick the first church I saw. And I called them up. I said, what time is church? They said, 11 o'clock. I'd already missed the 10 o'clock services at all the liberal churches. So God had a Bible-believing church starting at 11 o'clock for me. Amen? They said, 11 o'clock. I said, where, where are you? They said, go out Broadway. When you see all the buses, that's us. And out I went. And I got saved. God drew me to Christ. And God gave me to Christ. I'm coming. And Jesus promised to receive me. And nobody's going to stand in my way. That ought to be our attitude. That's the old time gospel. That's the gospel that Philip was preaching. He didn't say, hey, let's get baptized. Well, I don't know. I don't really believe in Christ. Oh, don't worry about that. Let's dunk them. Rack it up. We baptized another one today. What a bunch of junk. Amen? John said, you vipers, who convicted you to get here? Give me some fruit. We ought to say, with pleasure, John, because I'm one sincere guy. I'm not going to hell. I know. Boom! Jesus Christ is God, and nobody's stopping me. Amen. Rather than go say, hey, who's going to reward me and give me a handout or a hot dog or give me a free vacation in Hawaii? Uh, if I'll get baptized. No, that ain't the way it goes, folks. That's Missouri talk. Let's serve Christ. Amen? Old time gospel. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask you to bless. Oh, thank you for that precious book. How would we know these things if you would not preserve the word for us? Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We couldn't be saved without it. Thank you for the great plan of salvation that you've put forth. And oh God, if there are any here today, I know just about everybody here, I think I know everybody here. I think they're all saved. But it's not what I think, it's their relationship with, with you and God, that they might profile themselves and prove themselves and then push themselves a little bit and say, you know what? I don't care what the old flesh says. Boy, the Spirit's taken over, and I'm going to serve Jesus Christ. I love him. He loved me first, and I love him back, and nothing's going to stop me. Thank you. And bless us, we have a short invitation here. This morning we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.